has been a part of this church longer than I am sure I know. She may or may not tell you how long, but we are delighted that she is not only a part of us here at Central, but a part of the Assemblies of God. She's a credentialed minister with us, and that's always an encouragement. I pray that it's encouragement to young people, you know, that um, God can speak to you and call you out at any time. I appreciate her and her family, their commitment to the things of God and to this church. Why don't you help me welcome tonight our good friend, Sister Linda Santamire. Sister Linda, God bless you. Thank you so much. It is indeed a joy to be here this evening and to share my heart with you. I, um, if I did not know that I had not spoke to Ricky before service about what my message was this evening, and if I had not spoke to Pastor about my message before this evening, I wouldn't believe it because the Holy Spirit has certainly orchestrated everything that has preceded what I have to say this evening. And I thank him for that. Um, I thank you as pastor did for making the effort to be here the, tonight and thank you pastor for the opportunity and the faith that you've demonstrated in me and allowing me to share. For those of you who have been praying for Aaron and Heather to get their furniture, it was shipped from Madagascar in December. It made it there last night, about 10.30. Can you believe it? It's been almost five months. It's, been the, it's the joy of missionary life, five months with no furniture. It's hurry up and wait, but we're glad that the furniture made it. Last week, we began a two-part message called Walking in Faith, Leaving a Permanent Legacy by looking at three key teachings from Psalms 90, 10 through 17, and two quotes. I think Pastor Pete is going to put a slide up that has those uh, comments from Psalms 90, 10. The uh, quotes, one is from Joyce Myers that states you can take you can't have a testimony without a test. And then a Chinese proverb, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I began a journey of what seems like a thousand miles about 20 years ago, driven by discontent in my spiritual walk and a deep desire to not only know about God, but to know him intimately, to know him personally, to... Um, be in relationship with him. I didn't know then that a test would follow later. I shared about examining my life's testimony uh, or, or about our legacy through Carrie Shook's book, One Month to Live, in, the early, two, in early 2010, and two of four focused opportunities that I believe the Holy Spirit revealed to me that required my participation and would leave a permanent legacy for my children and grands and for generations of Santa Myers yet to be born. It was hunger for an intimate relationship with God and the guidance of the Holy Spirit that drew me to prioritize my time in his word, to see law, to pause and think about what I was reading in the word of God, not to just mark it off the chart, to, to, but to ask the Holy Spirit, how can I apply this reading to my life? That practice changed my perspective on the unchanging word of God, and it grounded my faith for a significant test when I was diagnosed with stage 4C cancer in 2019. Last week, I also shared my adventures in asking the Holy Spirit to teach me to pray and the corrections he made in my prayer life and the different styles of prayer that he has led me to and, the, and my practice of those. Again, you're invited to join us on Tuesday mornings as we practice prayer. Those were the first two opportunities the Holy Spirit revealed to me that required 100% participation on my part. If I would do the natural, he would do the supernatural. Neither, neither of those things would just happen on their own. My effort in pursuing uh, those opportunities would have a direct correlation on both my continued desire for intimacy with God and my desire to leave a permanent testimony for those who fall behind, follow behind me. The same holds true for you. We never arrive. There's always something for us to learn. 
Those two things also have a direct correlation in the next two opportunities that we'll look at tonight. I cautioned you last week as I caution you tonight. Don't wait for a crisis to deepen your walk of faith. Sunday's guest speaker pointed out uh, the hopelessness of our times. But let me assure you, when your faith is firmly cemented in the Christ, in Christ the solid rock, we, you and I, can stand firm regardless of what the world throws at us. He is truly our hope. Just like we, last week, I want to assure you that I don't get it all right. I, like you, fail, and I make mistakes, and the good news is God is merciful and full of grace, and he gives us second and third and 999 to the 10,000th power chances to start over again, and for that I am deeply grateful. Father, I ask you to anoint each word that I speak. May everything I say bring glory to your name. I ask that these teachings create a hungry hunger in your people and continue to fuel, fuel the hunger that I have for you. And I ask this in the powerful name of your son, Jesus. Amen. The next slide. I was introduced to a new term last week. At least it was a new term for me. Maybe you already know it. Adjacent possibility. The adjacent possible is the thing that makes other things possible, which made me think of an older terminology known as cause and effect. The relationship between two things when things, two, two things, when one thing makes something else happen. Science uses experiments in cause and effect to create explanations, and engineering seeks to reach design solutions with cause and effect. Think about cause and effect or adjacent possibility this way. For example, if we eat too much food and don't exercise, we gain weight. Eating food without exercising is the cause. Weight gain is the effect. Tonight, I offer you the concept in, spirit, in a spiritual context, built, building on last week's teachings. The cause, savoring the word of God, is like eating a good steak. And prayer is directed by the Holy, directed by the Holy Spirit is the exercise. The effect, or the adjacent possibility, that results from time in the word of God in prayer is praise and worship and caring for one another. As a, as a disclaimer, I never have led worship in my life because I can't carry a tune in a bucket. I have zero musical talent, rhythm, or skills. My ability to do even make an a joy joyful noise to the Lord became hampered in 2017 when I developed severe asthma. As a result, I often can't even make that joyful noise, but I can mouth the words I can sing them in my heart and I can raise my hands and I can give God glory because he is worthy. He is worthy. The next slide is, is just a little clarification to let us look at what the dictionary and a concordance has to say about praise. Praise is admiration, it's acclamation, it's applause, it's praise, is, is thanksgiving. Recognizing the good acts of God. So think about praise in those terms. Scriptures present praise as highly spirited, joyful, and uninhibited giving of thanks. God asks all creation to praise him. I think, I think of praise as a choice. We either choose to do it or we don't. And shame on us if we don't. We can praise God in a storm even when our heart does not feel it. And our circumstances don't dictate praise because in our head, in our head, we know that he is good and he is kind and he is full of love and he works all things out for the good of those who love him. I think of praise as head knowledge. Next slide. Worship goes deeper than praise. It can be said that worship is an attitude or a state of heart. This worthiness is the, his worthiness is the cause of worship. It is the effect that bubbles up and over giving away to heart passion as a result of knowing him intimately, 
from spending Selah time in the word of God in prayer. Worship is the heart's passion that results from head knowledge. Worship is reverence, adoration, respect, devotion. In Christianity, worship is an act of attributing reverence and honor and homage and tribute to God, not for what he does, but for who he is. We were created for one reason and one reason only, and that is to worship him who is worthy. Worship is 100% all about him, not what he does, but because of who he is. Every word we speak, every action we take is all about giving him praise because he is worthy. Revelation 4.11 states, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and they were created. Do you know what's coming when someone says, I'm telling you this out of love? (laughs) Pastor's laughing, he knows. It means they're going to step on your toes. So get ready. (laughs) The worldwide church has warred over music styles for centuries. And I believe that it is a demonic diversion to keep people of God, God's people, from worshiping God as he deserves to be worshiped. Rick Warren states in the Purpose Driven Church, there is no such thing as Christian music. There are only Christian lyrics. It is the words that make songs It is the words that make a song sacred, not the tune. If I played a song for you without the words, you'd have no way of knowing it were a Christian song. Have you heard Dolly Parton and Zach Williams' new country music song, There Was Jesus? What a beautiful song. A song of encouragement to believers. And I can find no fault in it. There was Jesus. There was Jesus. Admittedly, everyone is not going to worship the same. Some worship quietly, while others, like myself, worship with my arms because my lungs won't always give me the air I need. So my arms are my worship. What am I going to, what I am going to say may step on your toes, and it is meant to cause you to examine your praise and your worship habits. That being said, I mainly worship, worship with my eyes closed because I'm easily distracted. One of the things that distracts me are the people who choose not to worship. I know God's heart has to be grieved. I know he has to be grieved. I'm both shocked and deeply saddened when I hear people say that they can't or they won't participate in worship because of a certain style of music. Some have been known to wait, at, wait until worship is over to come into the sanctuary. They think they are making a statement by not participating. They are, but not the statement they think. The statement they are making is about themselves, not about the music or the music director. Shame on those folks who choose not to praise him because they don't like the style of music. Praise and worship, regardless of your style, is an opportunity to say thank you to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who died on the cross for our sins and set us free from bondage, the one who heals all our our diseases. He is worthy of our praise. That 20 to 30 minutes that begins every church service that we call praise and worship is not about you. It's not about what you like and what you don't like. It's not about the style of music. It's about him and his worthiness to be praised. I included spiritual aspects of worship, both for individuals and as a corporate body in your handout. It appears to me, if you choose to worship as we have been led here at Central for the, ha- for the past half century plus of my life, Pastor, <laughs> we are doing it as good as it gets as it gets. There, I can't find any argument with the way we are led in worship. Uh, Ricky's done it all right. He has done it all right. Praise and worship here is a dress rehearsal for eternity. Think for a moment. 
do you really think that the God who created 10,000 species of ants, 10,000 species of ants, do you really think that that God would only be uh, in tune with one style of praise and worship or one genre of music? I don't think so. Or that he would only respond when we sing old hymns versus new hymns? I think not. I think not. What we do in praise and worship here now, today, and tomorrow is just a warm-up for eternity. And it behooves us to be warmed up. It behooves us to be warmed up. I cannot tell you how excited I am at the prospects of seeing Jesus face to face and being able to sing my praises to him with gusto, in perfect pitch, on key, in harmony, to learn new styles of worship and songs, to be led by the angels and the four living creatures, and I want to fall down and worship him with all that I have in me with the 24 elders. It begins now, right now. If I stepped on your toes, I'm sorry, but I don't apologize. I do truly love you, and I don't want any of us, including me, to face God and hear him say, it's a shame that you did not choose to shame to praise me when you had the opportunity. God forbid, God forbid. Participating in praise and worship inside this sanctuary is monumentally important, but praise and worship does not stop here. It extends far outside these walls. It is true praise, it is true that praise and worship is not about us, but it is about him. However, scripture also tells us, and I can attest to the fact, that praise and worship, both in the sanctuary and in our day-to-day -day life, has tremendous benefits to us. In a church service, it prepares our hearts to be hungry for the message from the word of God by bringing us to a place of humility as we consider how great he is and how limited we are. It also plays a significant role in our testimony or our, leg or our legacy. I believe it's the third key ingredient to my healing, and I'd like to explain that to you. When I was diagnosed, I was led by the Holy Spirit to begin a playlist on my cell phone. I didn't have one before then. I'm very old school girl, so I had new tricks I had to learn. But I developed a playlist of praise and worship I so chose songs from all genres of Christian music, including old and new, and I played them continuously before my first surgery. The first song on the playlist was I'll Raise a Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit gave me that song two weeks before I was ever diagnosed. And it included all my favorite songs, like Great is Thy Faithfulness. There were seven hours of praise and worship songs uh, by the time I got finished and Crable got the bill. <laughs> it took that play, I took that playlist into surgeries and recovery rooms and I played them as lullabies to put me asleep in hospital rooms when I was alone and when I was scared. Those praise and worship songs built my, my confidence in Jehovah Rapha, my healer, as I shuffled and, and as I shuffled through my neighborhood to regain my strength, I played that music on the speaker of my cell phone. Song by song, my faith was encouraged to call what I could not see in the natural as truth. I was healed. I was healed. And my neighbors, they would stop and listen as I would pass by. They tried nonchalantly not to act like they were noticing but I know that they did. I no longer shuffle. I now meander through the neighborhood. But as I walk, I continue to play my phone on the speaker, hoping that my neighbors are listening. The word of God gives us more reasons than are listed in your handout to include praise and worship in your quest to know him more intimately and to leave a legacy or a testimony that will permanently live on beyond us. 
Next slide, please. Praise and worship extends beyond music. It extends into the way that we live our lives day by day. The number one action form of both praise and worship in this life is obedience. In 1 Psalm 15, 22, we see this truth. Samuel, do, Samuel speaking, does the internal one delight in sacrifices and burn offerings as much as in perfect obedience to his voice? Be certain of this, that obedience is better than sacrifice. To heed his voice is better than the offering of fat and rams. Obedience takes praise and worship to another level. It bumps it up another notch. Obedience involves not only choosing to do what we have heard God tell us to do, but doing it with a good attitude. Obeying with joy, even when we don't understand, is true obedience. Obedience is the purest form of praise and worship to the one who is worthy. Wholehearted obedience is done joyfully with enthusiasm. The Bible says, obey him gladly in Psalms 102. According to Holman's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, a succinct definition of biblical obedience is to hear God's word and act accordingly. Biblical obedience to God means to hear, trust, gladly submit, and surrender to God and his word. Knowing him intimately through the word of God in prayer leads to the desire to worship and praise him through obedience. This is the attitude of David, and I pray that the Lord will give me that attitude. Just tell me what to do and I will do it, Lord. As long as I live, I'll wholeheartedly obey you. That is my prayer. I started out this evening talking about adjacent possibility or cause and effect. When we walk with worship and obedience intermingled hand in hand, we'll see a difference in our lives. Obedience flows from and is enabled by a heart of gratitude for God's grace in Christ. That's the path to a life that leads upward towards the prize of Christ Jesus. Praise and worship because he is worthy is the cause. There are many guidelines found in the word of God that gives us the effect that praise and worship has through obedience on the life of a Christ follower. You, like me, could probably suggest many forms of obedience that we can use as praise and worship in our walk with God. I've put some in our handout. The first one is the words we speak about God in our lives to others. Simple words like, thank you, Father, for walking with me this morning. Thank you, Father, for my family. Thank you for my health. Thank you for supplying my needs. Or the third one, excellence in the excellence in the work of our hands representing God on the job brings him praise it's an act of obedience or number four attitude towards the unsaved when we actively witness we are praising God for the gift of our salvation and obediently following the great commission when we are faced with trials and hardships let's remember that Satan may buffet our bodies but he can't imprison our praise. I'm going to say that again. When we are faced with trials and hardships, we need to remember that Satan may buffet our bodies, but he cannot, he cannot ever imprison our praise. Our praise equates joy. Dropping down to... Um, the eighth one, it may be that our greatest act of worship may not happen on Sunday morning, but on Thursday afternoon. When God whispers to us, tell that cashier that's ringing up your groceries that I love her. In obedience, we will reach new heights in our worship experiences. Do you remember the story of the widow's might? 
What moved this woman to give everything she had to God remains a mystery. But what is clear is that God considers giving as an act of worship. It is truly an act of worship. When we exhibit the Christ-like character trait of generosity and manifest it, let it be manifested in our lives, we may discover a deeper worship encounter than we've ever known before. We ended last week with a style of prayer called responsive reading. It's also a form of praise and worship as we completely respond, hallowed be thy name. In Psalms 103, David writes, I bless the holy name of God with all my heart. Yes, I will bless the Lord and not forget the Lord glorious things he does for me. Psalms 104.3 states, I will praise God to my last breath. I have determined with God's help, praise and worship will be a permanent part of my life. It will be a permanent part of my legacy that I will leave to my children and my grandchildren and to the Santa Myers that have not even been thought of yet. The last of four opportunities to pursue intimacy with God and developing a permanent legacy and testimony for those you leave behind is caring for God's people. You understand why I said in the beginning that through Ricky's songs he chose and through the comments that Pastor said that the Holy Spirit has truly orchestrated this evening. An 11-year-old girl and her 8-year-old brother bickered and fought over the slightest things. That could have been Beth and Aaron. They're now best friends, but when they were children, they fought over the air they breathed. Their father was surprised. Uh, this, in this story, their father was surprised when the girl made an artistic card for her brother's birthday. And inside she wrote, Happy birthday to my nine-year-old brother. I'm so glad to have a brother to love. So God gave me you. And then there was a PS. And it read, Don't read this out loud or I'll twist your head off. <laughs> I asked the Holy Spirit to teach me how to pray for myself when I was in treatment. He gave me four strategic prayer points and instructions not to seek my healing, but to seek him. The last prayer point was help me, that he gave me to pray, was to help myself, help me, Lord, not to get so, so self-absorbed with what was going on in my life that I would forget that other people were hurting too. Now, I have to be honest. When the Lord gave me that as the first point in instructions on how to pray for this situation that I found myself in, that would not have been on the list. I had a lot of other things I'd have put on that list. But those were the, there, that was one of the four he gave me. And I diligently prayed them every day. But as always, God does all things well. Did you know that the study of psychology tells us that one of the best cures for depression is helping others? When you reach out to others, you're actually improving your own mental health. It's true. Every time I reached out during those days of um, surgeries and chemo and weakness, every time I reached out to someone else with a card or called someone else, my spirits were lifted. The postmaster, if he didn't know Crable by first name before, he knew him by first name then because he was always going to the post office with cards for somebody. I learned through that experience that there was always somebody who had greater problems than mine. Always. Because caring for another person is seldom prom promoted in our me first society, I put together scripture references for you that I found during that time to help direct you and I to know how to care for one another. And that too is in your handout. God's word is full of examples and scriptures about caring for others. 
It gives us Christian examples like Tabitha or Dorcas. Uh, they, she quickly comes to mind because of my years with missionettes. And what about Ruth and Naomi or Boaz and Ruth? Or the widow of Zarephath who used her last meal to cook for Elijah? Or the Shumanite woman who prepared a room for Elisha? I also learned many lessons on how to care for others from this body of Christ. I learn from you, my friends and my family, um, and amazingly from other Christians that I barely knew what it meant to care for one another. For the next few minutes, I'd like to brag on you, and then I'll close with just a few short comments. During the time I was in treatment, I had multiple surgeries and six months of chemo, and I can't tell you every person's name who reached out to me, but I'd like to give kudos to some who were outstanding in their caring practices of one another. During that time, there was a continual flow of meals and gift cards for meals that came to our door. Our dinner table was never empty. The meals were delicious. Karen and Mike Benson were regulars at our door, laden down with all that you would ever want for a meal. There was a woman that I barely knew, and I truly barely knew her, who called me and said the Holy Spirit told me that I was to prepare a meal for you one day a week the entire time you were taking chemo. And Friday is the best day of the week for me. Would that work for you? And I said, bless the Lord, yes, it will. <laughs> you come on, come on down, you know? So bless her heart, she knocked on my door every Friday with a complete meal down to a loaf of bread and a pound of butter to carry us through the week. Amazing, amazing that God does those kind of things in, in helping his people care for one another. I received a humbling amount of cards, and I asked Pastor Pete to put a picture up there for you. That basket contains literally hundreds of cards, and I spread some out on the table. Claudette Phillips, you rarely missed a week without sending me a card. And I can't tell you what her cards and those cards, the cards you sent, what they did to me. They filled me with hope. They filled me with joy. They filled me with the love of God because I knew if you took the time to send a card, you were taking the time to pray. I knew that. Polly Weber and Tata Ware were regulars who just came and sat. They just came and sat. And they talked about normal life. And I can't begin to tell you how much I needed the presence of godly women in my life. And I needed to talk about normal. They too brought delicious meals. I received two prayer shawls, Pastor Pete, if you could put them up. One from a total stranger. I, had, I didn't even know this woman. Nothing. But it showed up in the mail one day and one from someone you all know and love, Norma Kirshner. Both were purple in my favorite color. One was my longtime friend, and she knew purple was my favorite color. The stranger had no idea, but God knew. God knew purple was my favorite color. Doris Shoot called me most days. Hers and many of your phone calls always seem to come at just the right time with the message I'm praying for you today, or is there anything you need? Those phone calls were lifelines, but not all calls were. Just a word of advice. If you are new to caring for others, if you are new to making calls to other people to encourage them, let me give you a couple guidelines. Keep them short and keep them uplifting. Do more listening than talking. When you call someone who is sick as much as they need people to call them, they don't feel like long conversations. And they just don't need nor can they handle 
neg negative input or bad news. They can't handle it. One person called me to tell me they were praying like they did for their family member who had the same thing as me that died six months before. And I didn't need to hear that. They meant well, but that was not what I needed to hear. Carolyn Butler rarely missed a day for six months without sending me a text, a text message that had a scripture or a prayer or a song or something funny. And those text, texts were medicines to my soul. That spring, my beloved yard was going wild before my eyes and I longed to have it tamed, but the doctor's orders and pain kept me out of the yard. I stood on my porch and I looked out the window and literally cried many mornings over something as insignificant as weeds in my yard. But God knew my heart. Pastor called and he asked what might be a pressing need that the church could help us with. Well, you all had covered the meals and that yard was just really bothering me. So I said, my yard, Pastor Pete, these are the results. If you could put those pictures up. Your love and concern and care were the fourth thing that brought healing to me. It's the fourth opportunity that we have to gain intimacy with God as we become his hands and his feet and to leave a permanent legacy behind. Crable and I have been loved by this body in tangible ways that are permanent testament to our family and our neighbors who watched what happened in our yard. They watched it all happening and many of them asked questions. And I was able to tell them about my church, about my friends, about my family at Central Assembly of God. I trust that you have grasped the cause and effect, the adjacent possibility of what happens when God's people spend time in the word of God purposely desiring intimacy with him. The miracles that happen when we practice prayer and the effect that those two actions have on our praise and worship and our caring for others. We, you and I, have a wonderful church and a wonderful pastor and his wife. We are blessed. We are blessed beyond measure. I believe the adjacent possibilities are yet to be imagined as we care for one another. As I close this evening, I'd like to leave you with four quick questions that will require extended soul searching when you leave this place. Have you ever stood in a cemetery and looked at the markers? Every cemetery marker has one thing in common, the dash. The dash between the day you're born and the day you die. It's, the dash represents how you choose to spend your days. I wonder, as I walk through the cemetery on the way to my parents' graves and notice other uh, uh, markers, how did these people spend their lives? What did they do with their dash? Did they spend it on things that are eternal or did they spend it on things that are here today and gone tomorrow? The first question that I'll ask you is, will your dash represent precious days searching for intimacy with the lover of your soul by spending daily time savoring his word like you would a love letter? Will it? Will your dash, will it re represent time that you have spent in prayer 
filling the golden bowls in the throne room of God with this sweet essence of intercession. Will your dash remind others of your praise and worship? The last time I saw my dad, I was sitting where Crable was sitting. My dad was sitting about where Linda Hardman's sitting this evening. And the song leader sang Amazing Grace. That was my dad's favorite song. And I turned around to see if he was there, and he was. And this is what I saw. This is what I saw. My dad with his arm raised and his eyes closed, praising God. That's the last time I saw my dad. Will your dash speak of obedience to praise and worship through your day-to-day actions? Will you, will you have cared for others in ways that when your name is mentioned, God will receive praise and glory? Will you re- be remembered warmly when your name is spoken? Like I will always remember many of you. Only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. Don't waste your opportunities. Don't waste your God-given opportunities to develop a walk of faith, to develop a permanent legacy that you can leave behind you. Don't waste your dash. Don't waste your dash. God bless you, friends. Thank you for putting up with me the last two Wednesday evenings. And I pray that something that has been said in these last two Wednesdays will put a hunger in your heart for intimacy with God. It will put a hunger in your heart for the word of God, for prayer to praise and worship him in this sanctuary and in obedience in your day-to-day life, that it will put a hunger in your heart to care for one another. God bless you. Amen. Come on, stand with me tonight. You know, I wrote a phrase down, when we care for others in crisis, we are demonstrating more of God's heart than possibly any other way. The problem is, I don't, I don't feel your crisis. I have to take it by faith. It's crisis to you, and I can see it, but I can easily create a thousand excuses why I can't do this or I can't do that. When I see this picture reminds me that there are probably 70 people that we maybe didn't show care in crisis over the last couple of years like we needed to. And so I'm driven back to my knees to say, God, forgive me for thinking about Wednesday night, Sunday morning, and the machinery of the church, and help me to do a better job in discerning crisis, discerning it. You know, when you're in it, when I'm in it, I know it. But I can't, you can't feel it like I feel it. And I can't feel like you do. But the Holy Spirit helps us. Amen. What a uh, great word. You know, that's a lot of what Sister Linda touched on. I wouldn't be able to say as pastor. But she can say it because she just walked it. And I appreciate that so much. Reminding us of the importance of the care. If you have kids here, make sure. Please get your kids. (laughs) I know, but but part of why I do that is I'm really telling you, get them in a timely fashion, all right? Most of you don't have kids, but occasionally we have kids back there that uh, we get, you know, fellowship on Wednesdays is rich, and we get to talk, and we forget, and our workers back there, yeah, amen. Father, thank you tonight for a powerful reminder of what it means not only to worship you and to love you, and to care for you, but to also receive your empowerment to care for others that love you. 
The Bible tells us again and again, reminded in the New Testament, that whenever we have the opportunity to, to do good for those, especially of the household of faith, God help me as a leader here to discern crisis among my brothers and sisters and to bring this body around them. I am so enriched by Sister Linda's testimony tonight of what she didn't just experience through somebody else or hear about or witness herself, but personally experienced it and can share the import of it, the impact that it had on her and her family. Thank you, Lord, that, that this church was able to care in crisis there, and may we be able to multiply that again and again, that we truly will be able to give you glory. Thank you tonight for uh, lifting us up and encouraging us with uh, not only this story, but the testimony of what Sister Linda went through and the healing, the restoration of all that you've done in her body, but more importantly, Lord, this journey that she's told us about over these 20 years of a different type of prayer life. Thank you for that, because that message is, is critical for us as well. Thank you tonight for my brothers and sisters. Bless us as we leave this place in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior and soon coming King Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, amen. God bless you, church. Have a beautiful night in the Lord, and I will see you very, very soon.